My name is Lawrence Klotz. I'm a urologic oncologist at University of Toronto. I'm the Sunnybrook Chair of Prostate Cancer Research and Professor of Surgery at the University. Low risk really refers to the risk that a given cancer will be aggressive or will spread and potentially be fatal. So the conventional stratification is we say low risk refers to Gleason grade group one, which used to be called Gleason six, or patients with only pattern three, it all means the same thing. Uh, grade group one with PSA less than 10. Now, in fact, we've moved beyond that a little bit. We know that uh, a PSA between 10 and 20 doesn't confer much more risk. We also know that there's patients who have small amounts of grade group four, uh, of pattern four, pardon me. So they would be grade group two or Gleason seven, who also have quite low risk disease in terms of the degree of threat that it poses to their health. So that's a good question. In most cases, yes. Uh, several groups, including ours, have tried to get a handle on the likelihood that grade group one will progress to a higher grade cancer. And part of the problem is if you have a patient who's diagnosed with grade group one and you rebiopsy them, uh, a proportion somewhere between 15 and 25 percent will turn out to have higher grade cancer. But in most cases, that's because of sampling. In other words, you've hit the higher grade cancer that you missed on the original biopsy. That's different from progressing over time to a higher grade cancer. The best guess is that the rate of grade group one or Gleason six, the term is de-differentiating or becoming a more aggressive cancer is somewhere around 1.5 to 2% of patients per year. So in the short run, it's really not an issue. If you're following patients for 10 or 15 years, maybe 20% of them will de-differentiate to higher grade cancer. In most cases, that's going from grade group one to two. And if the patient is elderly at that point, because you've been following them for 15 years, it still may not be an issue in terms of a life-threatening cancer. So it happens, but it's not that common. So for the vast majority of patients who have grade group one prostate cancer, PSA in the range of 10 or less or 15 or less, there's a general consensus which is now worldwide that active surveillance is the standard of care that these patients in most cases should be managed conservatively that they don't need treatment. And you know, worldwide there are essentially almost no patients who have only grade group one cancer who have gone on to have the cancer spread to elsewhere in their body. It's a non-metastasizing cancer, which is why the uh, approach of conservative management is so appealing. Um, there's some groups where uh, conservative management is not appropriate, and they're mainly the groups who have what is called germline mutations or a uh, inherited abnormality in what's called DNA repair pathway. So these are mutations in genes like BRCA, which uh, some people may have heard of. There's a whole family of them. Those patients tend to get very accelerated accumulation of genetic abnormalities. And there's a general consensus that in uh, probably most of those patients should be treated radically. But for the vast majority of the remainder uh, there's a general consensus that no treatment is required. You still have to follow the patients to make sure they don't have something worse. So active surveillance is a concept that you use time to give the patient opportunity to reveal whether he's got a serious cancer or not. So as I mentioned, the majority of these patients are at no risk for the disease metastasizing, but a proportion of them harbor higher grade cancer that you don't know about, or will go on to progress to higher grade cancer. So the idea is you follow them, 
You do the PSA, we do it every six months in most patients. You re-image periodically, either with MRI, uh, there's another technology called high resolution micro ultrasound, which seems to perform uh, comparably. Uh, and there's new imaging modalities coming down the pipe like PSMA. So you, you use these imaging modalities to reevaluate the patient, re-biopsy the patient periodically, although as we've relied more and more on the imaging, we do the biopsy less and less frequently. And the data is that in around, somewhere around one patient to four, one in four or maybe one in three, over time, this higher grade cancer reveals itself and then you offer the patient treatment. And the data is that with that kind of strategy, the likelihood that the patient will have a poor outcome, meaning that the disease will spread to incurability, is almost zero. And the, the actual figure varies from about one in a thousand to 1.5 in a hundred. It's very low. Definitely. Well, active surveillance doesn't preclude treatment. It's, the idea is you're, you're monitoring the patient with the option of treatment if their risk gets reclassified from low risk to intermediate or higher risk. So, you know, I mean, I think it's, it's common sense that by just monitoring the patient, you really have every option for treatment if it looks like they need something done. And often these patients are very good candidates for focal therapy because, for example, a common scenario is you're following a patient, you repeat their MRI, now they have a new solitary lesion they didn't have before, you re-biopsy it, it's a higher grade cancer. These are gorgeous patients for a kind of partial gland ablation approach. Well, we have a lot of data on that. There's now approximately 15,000 patients who have been reported on followed prospectively, meaning they're followed over time. Uh, and the, as I mentioned earlier, the rate of progression to metastasis, meaning the disease has spread and would now be considered incurable and life-threatening. In some series, it's as low as one in a thousand. In other series, it's a little bit higher. There's no series where it's more than around two to three percent. That's with 15 years of follow-up. And we, there's now many uh, hundreds of patients who've been followed for 20 years, and there's no evidence that even with that very long period of follow-up that their risk increases significantly. Virtually all patients with low-risk prostate cancer are candidates for this conservative approach. As patients get older, and meaning particularly over the age of around 75 or 80, and as they accumulate more diseases that pose a threat to their life expectancy or reduce their life expectancy, heart disease, diabetes, and so on, uh, then radical treatment has less and less of a role and less and less benefit for those patients. You really need to have a life expectancy of at least five or even ten years to benefit from definitive radical treatment of localized prostate cancer. So in these older patients, they may, even though their disease is not necessarily low risk, they may be candidates for conservative approach. Being young with grade group one prostate cancer, those patients actually benefit more from active surveillance because they, don't, they aren't exposed to the risk of things like erectile dysfunction at a young age. Uh, erectile dysfunction is viewed as a lot differently from a guy who's 50 than a guy who is 75. So young age is not a contraindication. Uh, there, there, there's, most patients who are young who are diagnosed with prostate cancer have small volume disease. Once in a while you see an outlier who's a young patient, say under 50 or 55, whose prostate is just loaded with grade group one prostate cancer. Rare. But these are outliers, and in those patients, you know, you have to think twice. Maybe, maybe if this patient really has very extensive disease, it's not so much that he's at risk for metastasis at this point, but the chances are in the, in the next 35 years that he still has ahead of him, that he may develop something much more aggressive and therefore you can make a case for treating him now.
So we don't know nearly as much about that as we should. There's a lot of tantalizing uh, aspects to this. So first thing is stop smoking. Uh, patients who smoke really, uh, you know, diagnosed with cancer from a physician's perspective, you have an opportunity to really change that patient's behavior. The second is that obesity is not good for prostate cancer. So uh, losing weight is not easy, but uh, we know that patients who are obese tend to do worse. The third thing is exercise. So exercise favorably influences what is called the tumor microenvironment, the cellular interaction uh, in multiple different ways. If, if exercise were a pill, everyone would take it, and I really encourage these patients to be physically active. The fourth is dietary modification. Uh, a diet that's good for your heart is good for your prostate. So everyone knows what that is, you know, moderate red meat intake, not too much uh, animal fat, plants and vegetables, good for your heart, good for your prostate. And then, so that's the kind of lifestyle diet area. Um, I don't advise patients diagnosed with prostate cancer to, dra to drastically alter their diet. And in fact, there's one randomized study that showed after two years, it really didn't make any difference in terms of things like PSA or repeat biopsy. But obviously a healthy diet has a big influence on your health over the course of one's life. And then there's um, kind of innocuous interventions. We don't have randomized data on these yet, but there's a lot of kind of indirect evidence that they may be helpful. So the first one is vitamin D. Uh, particularly in the northern regions, I'm in Canada, you know, the average middle-aged Canadian has got vitamin D deficiency in the winter. They don't get enough sun exposure. And there's a lot of evidence that low levels of vitamin D are associated with higher rates of prostate cancer progression. So I encourage patients to go on vitamin D if they're in a northern region where there's not that much sun, sunlight. Number two is statins. So there is a lot of evidence that statins that people take to lower their cholesterol are really a prostate cancer drug as well. And they act along pathways, they inhibit some pathways that uh, can lead to molecules that actually stimulate prostate cancer growth. So I encourage patients to go on a low dose statin if they have normal lipid levels. If, they're already, if they already uh, have high cholesterol, then obviously they have a significant cardiovascular benefit as well. And then the third one, and the trial is just being done now, but there's a lot of epidemiologic data, is a drug called metformin, which is an old diabetic drug. Uh, metformin really seems to be a kind of health promotion drug. It seems to reduce the rate of pro proliferation of prostate cancer. And studies comparing diabetics who are on metformin versus not show very significant reduction in the rate of prostate cancer mortality in the ones who are on metformin. So again, these recommendations are not supported by randomized trials, which is kind of the scientific standard that we like to have when making recommendations like this. But for people who feel they want to do something, uh, the appeal of the vitamin D, statin, metformin, not expensive, safe drugs, probably have some benefit. Yeah, so generally every six months. Uh, active surveillance refers to the strategy that if you find higher grade cancer, you're gonna treat it. So once, if the patient's been followed for many years and they reach their, the age of around 80, where the benefit of that, of local treatment is marginal, then we go to once a year PSA. But for m mo the average patient being followed until they get quite elderly, PSA every six months. Uh, we re-image around every two years. In my practice, I tend to alternate MRI with micro-ultrasound. Uh, I think they're complementary. 
Uh, the micro ultrasound hasn't caught on that widely yet, although uh, it, it's uh, more people are starting to do it. But some kind of imaging around every two to three years. It doesn't have to be more often than that unless there's a signal something else like the PSA increases dramatically, for example. For a long time, there were some groups who biopsied patients every year. We never did that in my center. We did it around every two to three years. But as we rely more and more on imaging, we do the biopsy less and less frequently. So I would say now, routine biopsy maybe every five years, uh, unless the imaging changes. So what, what happens more commonly is the PSA has, another, has a MRI, say at a two or three year interval, there's a new region of interest or a new abnormal suspicious area, we go after that. More aggressive cancer doesn't really have any symptoms, that's the problem. More advanced is a different story. So uh, in the olden days, before we had PSA screening, about half of newly diagnosed patients presented with back pain from spread of the prostate cancer to their vertebra. They were, they were, their symptoms were of pain from metastatic disease, and of course that, that's incurable. It's treatable, but incurable. So uh, a, a common misconception is that urinating symptoms are a sign of prostate cancer. So by and large, that's not true. The prostate gets bigger as men get older, and they, uh, it, it starts to cause more urinating symptoms, but it's benign enlargement. So, Patients who have urinating symptoms, which are very, very common in this age group, uh, by and large, it's got nothing to do with prostate cancer.